Am I right? So we got some obstinate ways when it comes to the gospel. The circle is a lot larger than what we thought. Amen? He died for all. Verse, uh, verse 15. And they he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. And he said, and he that died for all, that they which should live not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto who? <clears throat> him who, which died for them and rose again. We already know who that person they talk about. Who rose again? Who died and rose again? Jesus. Jesus. Now who should not live unto themselves? Us. <laughs> We should not live any long to ourselves. I don't owe myself anything but a burial. That's it. That's it. I don't, I don't owe myself absolutely nothing. My thoughts, my appetites, my hang-ups, my mindsets. I don't owe it anything. I don't need to self-justify none of that stuff. We live... As people of the cross, as people of the way, as members of the highest institution in the earth, as citizens of the kingdom that's above every kingdom, we no longer have a right to what we say, what we, how what we think, and what you know, all the things that we said over in Isaiah 58. My own words, my own ways, and my own flesh. I have no right to me any longer. But verse 14 is the key. But the love of Christ constrains me. The Greek word it says is to urge or an hell. It means to hold together, to be held by. You mean that his love is, I mean held, I mean constrained by his love? Yes. If you ever fall in love with God, if you ever get a, a, a relationship with him, a working relationship, not, not a, uh, it, I'll be nice. Not a halfway relationship. Not a relationship that you become his copy mind. I'm talking about you become his bride. You become one with him. You're so intertwined with him. And that you, you don't have a desire to do anything that's contrary to him. It'll begin to hold you. Then you don't have to have, you see, you don't have to have nobody arms on you. If you're married and you, 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 you don't need nobody outside of that other than your wife to hold on to you. I'm talking about it's literally him putting the imprint in you. It's his finger on you. I want to be close to hell by the Lord. Uh, okay, uh, okay. It also means closely occupied with any business. I want to be pre preoccupied with his business. It means to be one with him and his love and his work. This love keeps us going in the right direction because it's his love that is to be our controlling and driving force. So everything that I am and everything that I do is a, is a, a testament to my love. If, I have, if the love of Christ constrains me, I treat my spouse a certain way. I'm just walk with me now. Walk with me. I know you didn't want to walk this way, but walk with me anyway. There's certain things, my communication is different. I don't have a razor tongue. Submission is easy. I follow directions. Because I'm not fitting for myself. I no longer live unto myself. I live unto him. When I find out what he did for me and how he liberated me, and he's offered me the best plan that's ever been available to mankind. That the wages of sin and death no longer have to hold on to me because I've been, I've been, I've been, hit the law of sin and death has been replaced by the spirit of life and peace. Life and peace has swallowed up everything that's not like him has been swallowed up in that covenant with him. Once you get a kiss from him, let me just say, how can I say that? Once you get intimate with him, you can no longer remain a harlot. A kiss from the Lord would take you out of whoredom. You can never, ever, you ever, ever experience what I'm talking about. Never got to worry about going back. Ever. Ever. 
Most people love God out of rules and regulations. And we love them because we are afraid that we might become who we were before we knew them. Most of us are staying in church or staying within reach of church. Not, close, not necessarily in love with them, but just in reach. That one day I'm going to fall in love and one day my change is going to come. Most of us, we go through the whole nine yards and we go through all the exercises and the routines you know, thinking that one day the formula is going to come to pass. And one thing I, I've noticed, I, it's really been running in my heart to add to the messages that I already have is, is to, to show you guys how to come into an encounter with the Lord. Because it's not really different. And it's, it's the correct way you have to look at it and look towards it and, and let Him pierce your heart and push back the veil of darkness and the mental limitations that's in your mind that won't allow you to, to, to launch out. you got to be able to just launch out to the Lord and let the Lord do what He wants to do in you. Amen? Amen? Amen. He died for all. The church needs to act like He died for all. But we can't act like He died for all when we're trying to kick against the bricks and go in another direction. We can no longer go contrary to what He's already established in His Word and the wooing of His Spirit and the drawing of his spirit. Now I'm going to show you as an example. I wanted to say this. I'm going to show you a young lady in scriptures. And you can go with me to over to, the, uh, to Solomon. The Song of Solomon, chapter 1. I'm going to give you a little bit. It's going to be just a little deep. I'm going to try to slice it up a little bit. But the greatest picture you can have in scriptures about uh, a love exchange and all those things is in the Song of Solomon. She was compelled. She was ready to go wherever he was. Of course, she was incomplete. She didn't know where he was at times. She had to go to certain people to find out where the lover was. And we know the story at the end of the book, <laughs> end of the chapter. He was always in her. But look at this in Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 1. Uh -oh. Yeah, verse 2. Yeah. Go ahead. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Now, I, I said, in the Greek is to be constrained and impaled. So you have this Shulamite woman. Let me set the backdrop. This Shulamite woman who uh, actually, her name is the same name as Solomon in the Hebrew. The Shulamite Solomon is the same name. It's just the feminine version of Solomon. Oh, yeah. But many scholars, come on, y'all, walk with me. Don't, don't, don't get distracted. Walk with me. Walk with me. I'm like, come sit in your lap. The Song of Solomon called in the Vulgate and the Septuagint, the Song of Songs, from the opening words, is a superior and excellent, it's a really a Hebrew idiom. So it's, a, it's, it's an allegory. The Song of Solomon is an allegory. And even the name suggests, because of the Song of Songs, it's really a condemnation to the holies of holies and the most holy place. So you just don't, you can't interpret this encounter, this adventure from the outer court. You can't even understand it from a Pentecostal mindset. You have to go beyond those two dimensions, Passover and Pentecost. We know it in here. You got to go, it's, a, it's really a book that shows you how to transition out of the holy place to the most holy place. That's why she said, your love is better than wine. Your love is better than Pentecost. Remember in Acts 2? And they stood up and they began to spot off stuff they never heard before because men began to speak in other tongues. That the people that were listening to the conversation said, these men are drunk. And Peter said, you, we're not drunk as you suppose. And then he told them, say, well, it's not wine because it's not the right hour. Glory. He said, but your love, his love, is better than wine. You got to understand, everything is in three, so the outer court is faith. The inner court is hope. In Pentecost, we have a hope. Am I right? Christ in you is the hope of glory, but Christ through you is glory. That third dimension is faith, hope is what? Love. That's the only place that got a seat in it. She was saying that, it, that is where I want to be. See, it was a time that you couldn't even read this book in 
And he breaks circles. If you did any study of Orthodox, they couldn't even read this book until they were 30. Because it was so intimate and so, so, so vague, not vague, but, you know, it was illicit, graphic. You know, and you couldn't even read it. And in some circles, we still don't read it right. But it's actually the evolution of somebody that's been brought into experience, actually the whole charismatic church. Because we're so enamored with the wine. But she's going to learn how to be constrained by his love. And she made that, she made a confession. She said, I would have had enough of you that I found out that your love is better than wine. Your love is better than speaking in tongues. Your love is better than the activation on yesterday. Well, well. As good and glorious as it was to some. This is walking apart from me. Been there, done that. Bought the t-shirt, wore it, and all that. Seen things done by the Lord. Seen greater manifestations. I heard God walk, I heard the Father, the Son, walk through a service. Walk like feet. Boom, boom. Feet five, four, four. I heard Daddy walk in the service before. When I was there in the Royal Face Center. So I, I've been around the block. And through experience, I can testify this morning and say his love is better than wine. Better than me casting out a devil. Better than me laying hands on the sick. Better than me prophesying. Better than me having an out-of-body experience. Better than somebody telling me you can prophesy, you can teach, you can preach. Better than that. His love will inoculate you. If you fall in love with him, you will never waste none of his gifts on you. The